keep it in your head. So this says a poem of Eichendorf of, of, of great bewilderment and disorientation. I don't know where I am. And a, a heightened emotion. Yeah. Uh, there is then the song of Reger and Jovengen, which uh, speaks also of heightened emotion and also of this kind of um, uh, frustration, uh, great emotional frustration. Uh, and pick up in the middle of that. My heart remains silent. Here, the words unspoken. And that's it. It's isolated and it's gone, just like in 135B it is. Yeah. So there, and on the words, on Stefan Zweig's words, the words unspoken. Um, just like he doesn't speak the fact that he's using Schumann's motive, drawn from a song that says a similar affect. Um, but indeed, there it is. So these sort of permeations um, drawn from a, a really intimate knowledge of the repertoires of the 19th century are really all over his music. Um, as I said, to a, a greater extent than I, than, I, than I really realized, I didn't find this one. Somebody else found it. A, a friend of mine, a wild friend of mine, was driving in the car. He was somewhere else in the United States. He was driving in the car. And he was listening to Schumann Liederkreis. And he pulled over, he said, pulled over to the side of the road, and he called me. And he said, <laughs> You have to listen because in I'm Dragon, I know that there's an illusion to the leader cries and she lands such a nasty. And so I looked and sure enough there it was. And he found it, you know, just listening on the radio. I mean in the car. Other sophisticated allusions to the 19th century canon arise in the form of Rager's work titles and the purposeful assigning of opus numbers. For example, Rager echoes Robert Schumann's symbolic adoption of children's themes. You may know that the image of the child is very important to Schumann with titles like Klavierstücke für große und kleine Leute, Opus 115, piano pieces for uh, big and small people. <laughs> Seeming to play on Schumann's piano duets, Opus 85, the Klavierstücke für kleine und große, Kinder, for small and large children. It has the same sentiment. Further, Rieger's Träume am Kamin, Opus 143, Dreams at the Fireplace, seem to allude to number eight of Schumann's Kinderszenen, Opus 15, am um, Kamin at the fireplace. Similarly, opus numbers and key centers sometimes suggest striking parallels with older repertories. It's difficult to miss, for example, the alignment of the cello sonata in F minor, opus 5, with the Beethoven sonata, opus 5, number 1, for the same instrument, um, same uh, uh, key, different mode, and with the piano sonata in F minor, opus 5, by Brahms. Opus 5 is just the F key, yeah, for them all. The three a cappella motets uh, collected by Rieger under the opus number 110 remind inevitably of Brahms' three motets assigned the same number, three motets, opus 110. Moreover, the third of Rieger's motets, opus 110, sets the same apocryphal text, O tut, wie bitter bist du, O death, how bitter are you, to, um, same harmonic plan, E minor to E major, as the third of Brahms' four serious songs, Opus 121. All of this and much more has given rise to the superficial notion of Rager as an epigram, a dead-end derivative and undistinguished imitator, precisely the image against which he ceaselessly campaigned. In an age of the considered composer, struggling against the weight of history and giving birth to fewer rather than more works, you know, nine symphonies rather than 106 of them, Rager made a point of compositional fluency, churning out music, some felt, with the regularity of an industrial assembly line. Even so, of the genres that symbolized for his era the pinnacle of mainline achievement, namely the opera, 
the symphony and the piano sonata, he produced none. His use of the word Schaffender, as I said, we come back to it, in the previously cited letter to the Duke of Meiningen is characteristic and significant. The word Schaffender translates only with difficulty in English and means simply a person who works and produces stuff, like a cabinet maker produces stuff, or a brick, brick builder builds a, brick, uh, builds a brick wall. The opposite of the genius who seems to wait on some vague miraculous inspiration from within. So a genius really doesn't, doesn't shaffen this. It doesn't go together at all. Yeah. His letters are saturated with references to the German verbs schaffen and arbeiten, work. Music is based in craft, workmanship, fluency, in short, ability, or the word können. His succinct contribution to a collection of essays honoring Richard Strauss's 50th birthday in 1914 encapsulates that attitude. Strauss is a thoroughly classical figure of the most solid ability, and once more, ability. I should mention at this point that um, there's a new biography of Rager out um, in German um, by Susanna Popp, who's the head of the Max Rager Institute in Karlsruhe, and it has one of the best titles for a book I've ever, ever, ever seen. It is um, it's a fantastic play on words. You know, the normal biography is life and works, uh, Rager, life and works. Well, Susanna has put out this book with the title, uh, Max Rager, um, Werk statt Leben. It means work instead of life. Yeah, so because he was so, he completely gave up life in order to just, he was so concentrated on work that he didn't have a life. So she inverts life and work to Werk and Leben, and she says Werk statt Leben. Besides that, when you put Werk and Stadt together, the Stadt doesn't mean instead of, Werk statt means a workshop. So it's a really, really, a really good title. I don't know how long it took her to figure that out. <laughs> That's a really good title. I haven't seen her yet, but I won't tell her. Really good title, and she can't make it in English. This little tour through Rager's aesthetic sensibilities brings me now to a final point in fact, back around to the point with which we began in Hildburghausen, his humor. The composer once remarked that when the Almighty had passed out humor, he, Rager, had simply lifted his hand twice. Mm -hmm. Recorded instances of Rager's quick wit are legion and could occupy us for hours. His pervasive and multifaceted humor in private conversations, as in letters, in his behavior, as in his music, often functions as a way to take up cudgels against his enemies. Partisan critics who find his music overblown, narrow-minded academics who dismiss him as anti-intellectual and misunderstand his relationship to the past. The locus classicus in the music has always been the violin sonata of the 72, the fourth sonata in C major, based on the unlikely ciphers Schaffe and Ache. So the spelled in, in, uh, in German letters, E flat, C, D, A, F, E, and A, F, F, E, Schaffe being sheep and Ache being ape. Um, which uh, ha originally um, carried the dedication uh, to the German critics, and which his publisher persuaded him to alter to too many people. Um, you hear that uh, at the beginning of that piece. This is a, a, a totally wild piece. Um, if you can explain what the first chord is to me, I would be happy. Think about it.
surely allude to Schumann's use of them in the Carnival, Opus 9, a work whose title might equally apply to readers of 72, Carnival. Um, uh, pianists will know this, um, this uh, motive that on which Carnival um, is based, uh, out of which Schumann intended his name. Yeah, Shah, Ash and Shah, and there is Shah. For often. Again, a, a Schumann reference. Even this sonata's ostensible key center, C major, he does get around to it eventually, functions rhetorically when read against the hyperchromaticism of its protracted musical argument, a work positioned self-consciously in the tradition of C major music that wraps complexity in an outer hull of simplicity. Um, pieces in that category include the Meistersinger Overture of Wagner, the Diabelli Variations of Beethoven, and for organists, the um, variations are from Himmelhoch, uh, BWV 769, um, the simplest key carrying the most complex ideas, that kind of um, juxtaposition being pleasurable, yeah, aesthetically. Rager was equally capable of sophisticated self-abasement, a kind of wicked humor aimed ultimately at his detractors. There is, for example, the otherwise innocent salon piece for piano called Ewig Dein, which doesn't carry an opus number, a clever lampoon on all the musical qualities for which he had been taken to task in the press. Its title, Forever Yours, seems to assure us that this composer's music will always be around, regardless of sophist critics and indifferent listeners. Rager assigns the piece the arbitrary opus number 17,523, sets its tempo as noch schneller als möglich, faster than possible, and adds a capricious footnote at the bottom, I ask that this piece be played backwards. So a la Krebs, so like cancer, like the crab, yeah. Um, then it will be sus sus substantially more bearable for ears that are dissonance pure and desirous of tonality. Here, the slight, that is Krebs, is not, of course Krebs means backwards, like it does in English, uh, the cancer or the crab canon to backwards. This slide is directed unmistakably at the critic, the contemporary critic, anti-Rager critic, Karl Krebs. Um, so it is to be played a la Krebs, um, and of course it calls up Karl Krebs. Um, Rager often seized on the humor value of his own palindromic last name, R-E-G-E-R, -E -E both ways, and on the notion that his music sounded the same in either direction to his weak-minded and weak-stomached <laughs> detractors. Further commentary capitalizes directly on the idea of listeners whose feeble constitutions are unable to endure his music. Already in 1900, when the composer sent an autographed copy of the organ choral fantasy on Alimentum des Sterben, opus 52, number one, to Karl Straube, he added the postscript on the score, have a sincere good time, dear Karl, in case deaths should occur due to the hearing of this crime, I will assume the burial costs. And of course, that entire thing plays on the, the subject of the Kral Alimentum des Sterben, all people must die. So this is a very nice, um, this is a nice one. Um, that kind of thing, of uh, that kind of humor, of always pointing to weak-stomached people or people who don't have health enough to hear what I have to say, um, has a counterpart in Ives, of course, uh, um, in this country. We'd love to do that. Still other such humor expresses contempt for self-conscious academic attitudes. The pianist who plays the Scherzando e Vivace from the second volume of Aus meinem Tagebuch, Opus 82, will find the succinct if bizarre instruction appended to the music, quote, I ask that this piece never be played for experts, unquote. Why it's there, I don't know. Just thought, felt like writing. Along the same lines is the note appended to the song, Die Mutter spricht, The Mother Speaks a setting of Sophie Zeibut's text portraying a mother trying to convince her daughter to avoid marriage. And here that is, speaking of illusion. <laughs> two bars transparently quote Mendelssohn's famous wedding march with the remark at the bottom. Hunters of reminiscence motives and similar mongers are reassured that this quotation is thoroughly intentional. 
The obvious criticism is directed to analysts who find ultimate meaning in surface detail. Perhaps the most well-known instance of Rager's humor and a summa theologica of his acrimonious relationship with the critics is a response to a review of the 7th of February, 1906, in which the Munich critic and Rager unfriendly critic, Rudolf Lewis, panned the Munich career, uh, premiere of Rager's first major orchestral piece, the Sinfonietta Opus 90. Lewis, writer, conductor, composer of Wagnerian persuasion and anti-Semite, was allied with the so-called New German School in the Bavarian capital and worked as chief music critic for the influential Munich paper, Münchner Meister Nachrichten. The first performance of Opus 90, the Sinfonietta, on the 2nd of February in that city, in fact had resulted in something close to a riot among conservatives and progressives alike, and in the days following, there were rancorous exchanges between the composer's supporters and detractors as sort of a prelude to the Rite of Spring controversy. I am sitting in the smallest room of my house, Rager wrote to Lewis in a transcript reply to his criticism that calls to mind the barbed humor of Hans von Dugo. I have your review before me. Soon it will be behind me. <laughs> that was it. A group of Rager's supporters even showed up at Lewis's house in the middle of the night, of, on the 9th of February, to wake him with a discordant caterwauling under his window. You know, this is a tradition in, uh, um, at the turn of the century to uh, kind of make sort of uh, ugly kinds of choral music to hound people. So it was like cats screaming or whatever. And they just lined up under his window and did this. Lewis had the last word, however, in a short statement he published a few days later, quote, permit me to express my most obliging thanks to the dear members of the Max Rager congregation. On 9th of April, they regaled me with a serenade in which, so far as I could hear, they performed passages from their master <laughs> symphonietta in a highly characteristic manner. <laughs> Shortly after that episode, Rager left Munich for an appointment in Leipzig. He was as confr confrontational and defiant as ever, determined to go his own way heedless of any partisan orthodoxy. But his departure from what he could only regard as Munich's cliquish atmosphere did not allow him to put either his critics or his own destructive tendencies behind him as he so vividly had framed it. By 1911, he would withdraw from Leipzig for mining in the wake of the scandalous premiere of the Piano Concerto, it was 114, and in 1914, a physical and mental collapse collaborated with other factors to force him out of his Kapellmeister position to a more private life in the university city of Jena. In middle age, as in younger years, he seemed destined to isolation in his musical convictions, to a life on the fringes of acceptability. He was that odd Kapellmeister, clad in the outer garb of social respectability, nevertheless striding rebelliously down the middle of Hildburghausen the hopelessly misplaced chapeau of a little girl affixed to his head. 